There's no secret, there's no shortcut. Everything that is alive is conscious. Be silent, be still, and know God. Until you feel worthy, it ain't gonna happen. Rigorous, ruthless, disciplined focus. You have to get to a place where you can work on yourself. Well, what's going on, ladies and gentlemen? I am Jay Campbell, and you are here for part two of this incredible podcast interview with Laura Knight Jadzik. Hope yeah. I said it right again. I said I said Yad. I said J. Yadzik. Sorry about that. Yadchik. LKJ Yadchik. I said I still can't pronounce it. And of course, Hunter Williams. And yesterday we had an absolutely amazing two hours and I think about 12 minutes. And it was just mind blowing, spellbinding. Like my skin was on fire for about an hour after. So uh part two. So I have a bunch of questions, um, but I definitely wanted to pick up and Hunter does too, of course, but I wanted to pick up from like where we finished yesterday, where we were really starting to talk about Christianity and really just, I guess, Abrahamic religious teachings. I mean, you bought, you wrote this amazing book, which I'm about a hundred pages into now from Paul to Mark paleo Christianity. Hunter did finish the entire book. And, you know, I've said this my whole life when I was six years old, I was raised Catholic. When I was six years old, I ran out of the back of Catholic church. And my dad chased me out of the back and he was like, where are you going? And I literally said at six away from that cult. And the, the idea that I was six years old and I understood that it was that and how it was just so baffling to me, you know, always told me. And, and ever since then, I've always just been like against most of the teachings. Uh, like you, I've studied it pretty deeply. Um, I took Latin throughout high school. So there was a lot of like, you know, Roman Catholic Latin Roman imperialism. I knew all of that stuff, but it just, it never sought, sat with me. And, you know, obviously Hunter was also raised, um, Christian, you know, Southern, not Southern Baptist Hunter. Yeah, more or less. They would call it evangelical Christianity as Laura knows, but it's just a newer term for Southern Baptist. Right. So all of this, I think have some form of call it Abrahamic religious teachings that we've been, that's foisted upon us at a young age. And obviously some of us have resisted it. But then some of us can't, right, because of our parents and because of the people in our communities and whatnot. But can you kind of just share, you know, your thoughts about how, at what point you really learned? Because obviously your books and the wave talk about, you know, your ex-husband and how you were really attempting to be a good Southern Christian woman and, you know, practice the teachings and all that stuff. But like, at what point did you realize that all was not what it seemed? Uh -oh. I thought that was a bizarre experience. I was sitting in church one day and uh, we had this really wonderful pastor. And this was not a Methodist church. This was a uh, church of God. You know that one. <clears throat> and he was, he had the most marvelous voice. And he was very educated and his wife was lovely and she played the piano beautifully and their daughter was just, you know, cute as she could be and they dressed so beautifully. And, and of course, this church had a really nice uh, parsonage, uh, you know, a, a really beautiful house that was attached to the, uh, to the church. And, I mean, not physically attached, but came with the, uh, the job of being the pastor there. And he could pray like nobody you ever heard in your life. I swear to God, he could stand. And he was good looking. I mean, the women just loved him. And he was he was standing up there and he was praying and carrying on. And, and I was sitting there and all of a sudden I had this sensation like I was sinking underwater. And you know how when you're underwater and you hear things, it's very strange. If they're very loud outside the water, you know, you kind of hear it in an echoey kind of way. So it felt like I was sinking underwater and hearing things very strangely. And all of a sudden, his words just became garbled nonsense. And I wonder, I, I thought maybe, you know, maybe my blood sugar was dropping or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I... I, you know, I, my head was bowed and everything. My eyes were closed. So I lifted my head up and looked and I could see this almost like a holographic, um, wolf superimposed on him. Wow. 
and I quickly shut my eyes because I was certain at this point that the devil was trying to get a hold of me and make me, you know, see this wolf thing. So I, you know, prayed even harder. And then after a minute, you know, I opened my eyes again and it was still there. <clears throat> so that was really, really strange. And then um, finally the, the, the effects of the, of the sensation and everything kind of faded and everything went on, but I'm just sitting there in this stunned state through the whole rest of, of the service wondering what the heck just happened? What the heck happened? And, you know, I'd already been, I'd been studying a lot about the Bible itself, you know, the, the text and the history of the text. And I was, you know, kind of in the early stages. And I learned that uh, things like, you know, the last, you know, few verses of uh, one of the gospels uh, wasn't present in the original text, but it was, it somehow got into the King James Version. And I had questioned the pastor about it, and he had told me, oh, well, you know, he started, you know, pontificating about the Masoretic Test, and then the Textus Receptus, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that had happened. But anyway, so there was, I already was having questions. Mm -hmm. So nothing happened until the following week when we went to church. And when we arrived, all the people were standing around outside, you know, milling about, you know, couldn't figure out what was going on. And we got out to find out, you know, what was going on. And there, there was, uh, you know, finally people told us that the pastor wasn't there and he wasn't at home, his car was gone. You know, you know, his family was gone with him. And it turned out, to make a long story short, <clears throat> that he and uh, his wife and daughter had basically done the midnight flip. And they took all the money from the, uh, from the church account. I mean, he had just received his, his pay, and then they also emptied out the church account. Wow. And... Uh, as it turned out, because I attended one of the directors, uh, the board of directors meetings uh, within a, a couple of weeks, you know, to try to figure out what to do about this, because they needed to get another pastor right away. And it kind of turned out that, you know, he had, um, I guess you'd call it a yacht, you know, a, a big cabin cruiser uh that he'd paid for with church funds and they'd been taking holidays vacations all these kind of things you know expensive restaurants and a lot of expensive clothing that the church had been paying for through you know the church bank account on top of what he was being right. paid. so <clears throat> all that transpired and i sat there and thought what i saw was the truth Maybe. Really, words. It was a wolf in sheep's. He was a wolf in sheep's clothing because the sheep's clothing was his, you know, attractive appearance, the appearance of his family, you know, all of that. The, the whole thing that that uh, was way he presented himself to the church, and that's that's not the only you know visionary type experience I've had, but that one was particularly associated with that. And at that point, I I just stopped going to church. I stopped. I, I didn't want any. Oh, well, there was another incident. We we, we did try to go to another church, um, <clears throat> Foursquare Baptist. And uh, uh, I said something during a Bible study class. It wasn't even a, a service. It was, and I raised my hand and asked a question. And the, the pastor looked at me like I, you know, was green or something. Then he started clapping his hands. And everybody that was in the room along with him started clapping their hands like this just to basically drown me out, you know, so I wouldn't say anything else. And I thought, wow. what kind of place is it where you can't ask a sincere question and can't get, you know, any kind of consideration for your concerns? Because if you have concerns about the text, okay, oh, I remember what it was. It was the... Uh, the uh, chapter in Acts that talks about the, uh, you know, Paul's uh, shipwreck. 
and where they, where they were talking about uh, they fetched a compass and and he'd been talking about well you need to go down into the cabin and get the compass so you know which way you're going. I happened to know that it was a nautical term that meant sailing in a circle. Fetching a compass means right. is, is uh, Elizabethan English for sailing in a circle because when you're in a storm. You know, you don't know how far off you are. And if you know you're in a relatively safe place, you just sail around in a circle until the storm dies down. And then you don't go up, get thrown up against the rocks. And I, I had made this comment, said, you know, that, you know, basically what you're, what you're teaching is not, you know, quite accurate. Right. And, you, and I'm sure you notice it from what I write is that I'm really, um, really particular about accuracy, both in terms of, you know, getting the information, putting the information down with clarity and footnoting that information and making sure that the words I use, you know, are accurate about that information. So, you know, I'm a real stickler and I was kind of being a little stickler, sticklerish here and they didn't really appreciate it. So yeah, I quit going to church and it, it, that was the beginning of a really hard I still believed and I still thought that the Bible was, you know, an inspired book. Yeah. Uh, I felt that if I could just get closer to the original text, I wouldn't have this barrier of things like Elizabethan English or um, added verses that didn't exist in the original text. I wanted to get back to the original text and find out what was really said and what was really thought and who said it and who thought it. And I spent years doing that. I mean, you, you, you can have no idea of, of the number of, of books and papers on text studies that I have read and, you know, figuring out, you know, what is valid, what is in the, the well, you can see the evidence of that when you read from Paul to Mark, because, you know, I, I reference a lot of those things, but <clears throat> yeah. It was a it was a painful process, yeah, very painful. painful. <clears throat> you know, I was I was sincerely uh, a, a Christian. I mean, I, I put myself in into it wholeheartedly. You're so, a devout you are a devout believer. Mm -hmm. as, Gerald Clark, as Gerald Clark says, you were suffering from the God spell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Who hasn't? <clears throat> Laura, I wanted to ask you, so when I look back at just my own experience growing up, <clears throat> in one way, I'm appreciative because I think my inquisitive nature around the Bible led me to develop like a framework for researching things to search for truth. Do you think that growing up religious and having gone through that, especially in your adult life, even though it was off base, that it actually helped you in your research develop like a critical thinking framework oh, sure. because the Bible is so en en enigmatic and you start to do all this research and then you start to piece stuff together. So do you think in a way that actually like helped develop your critical framework and understanding of how to research? Yeah. And there's actually a book about that written by a Canadian psychologist, Bob Altemeyer. It's called Amazing Conversions. And he talks about the fact that Christians who leave Christianity, who give up their faith and, and basically step out of the church. Um, well, in, in tests, they test as being, you know, very intelligent and, and some of these psychological personality tests, they test for being, you know, independent thinkers, critical thinkers, all these kind of things. And so he, he got a lot of them and tested them. And then of course he, he had a, a corresponding group that, became converts after being raised in say atheistic households and interestingly the ones who became converts after being raised in a godless home were less intelligent uh, <clears throat> along with other personality factors but you have to read the book to get all of the different factors but in any event what he said was that somebody who was raised in, in a christian home the first thing is is they are taught to value truth because Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And of course, it's the truth, this book right here, you know, this is the truth. This is the word of God, you know, you know, and 
and I believe in it and that sort of thing. But you you're taught to value that. Right. Right. And and the thing is, is that, that very teaching, you know, works against right. religion. Because when you start thinking about the truth and you start praying, as I did, you start uh, you start turning your questions on your religion itself because you begin to see that there are things if you're if you're sincere you're reading the bible right yeah. catholics don't read the bible you're you're not you know not <laughs> work jay i yeah. have read the bible though but just continue <laughs> but as as a rule they don't read the bible True. but you know i read i read it the first time through i think when i was like 11 years old or something and i've read it through from start to you know cover to cover several times and if you do that and you're reasonably intelligent, you see like, that what? contradictions are in there yeah. and there's a whole lot of things that don't fit. And that inspires you to ask some questions. And yeah. if, if you don't get immediate answers, if you're persistent, you start looking for answers on your own. And then you end up finding out, oops, you know, and, and you think about Pascal's wager, you know, better to believe and be found to be wrong than to not believe and to be found to be wrong. Well, forget about that. You know, what if you believe in something that's such a, a complete mishmash of, of nonsense? Yeah. Because God is testing whether or not you have brains enough to find something <laughs> out of it and and get to the true spiritual nature of yourself and your life and the world and, and God and everything in it. That's so, what my dad used to say say to me, by the way, just uh, the whole Pascal thing, but he used to say it's risk beneficial to believe. That's what he used to say to me. No, it's it's not. It's not very beneficial because you have to you have to swallow a whole lot of nonsense. Yes. You know, I one of my aims when I wrote from Paul to Mark was to save Mark, uh, Paul, to pull his buns out of the fire because I was convinced from reading the Pauline epistles that this was a sincere man. And he had a sincere idea and he was doing some very uh, difficult things and living a life that was, you know, what, what we would call a holy life in, in some sense. And that he was, he had some kind of Christianity that was, that was different from what the Jerusalem Christians had. It was very different. And all of that is, is clear as day if you read the Pauline epistles. Right. And I mean... You know, he said things like he wished those people in Jerusalem, and, and that includes, you know, James and Peter and Cephas and all that. He wished they would castrate themselves, you know, that they were enemies of the cross of Christ. You know, he said those things. Right. And people never stopped to think about that. And I, and I really thought about that. And I thought, you know, something is going on here. Something is really wrong here. And I felt so much... I, I feel sympathy for Paul. You know, how did what he was doing get converted into this over here? Mm -hmm. You know? Well, the one thing that the one thing that blows me away about whatever we want to call it, whatever happened at the you know, Council of Nicaea and just, you know, the 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 Spanish ink was I mean, just sending, you know, what they did to the Americas, to Mexico, to Latin America, destroying, you know, all of the spiritual houses of worship or the spiritual practices and then building the or erecting the quote unquote you know cathedrals and the churches and these giant you know monasteries or whatever you want to call them over top of all of them and i've been to so many of these places um and it's just the energy of those places is just it's off but um i guess the the, the real question you know we'll get to you know the idea that it's the fourth density drachmoids that are behind you know the, per, the perversion of, of the teachings but like what really happened? Like when the people, when, when, when the conquistadors or whatever you want to call it, this, you know, came into the Latin America and came into um, the, the indigenous lands and, and places and they did this horrific, were they under the, you know, the, the, the mind control of the fourth density, you know, well, you beings? know, it's like I said, you, you don't have to be under yeah. the control of fourth density. Yeah. If you have, been convinced to <clears throat> believe something and and if one person yeah i guess your organization 
you know, is under that control. And then they give out edicts. They preach sermons. I mean, you know, look Sla at that. I mean, I just slaughtering innocence is just, <laughs> you're right. I mean, it's proven in Japan. It happened. It happened in, 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 in World War II in, in Germany. I mean, it's just, it's incredible what can happen when, like you said, that people fall prey or, or fall into the illusion. Yeah, and it kind of kind of try to get over um, that Christianity was responsible for all of these terrible, I mean, it's, you know, it started with, it started very early on, Cathars, sure. and I've, yep. I've a deep study of the Cathars, and because uh, uh, I live in Cathar country, sure. I can yep. look out the window and I can see Abbey Bell Persh, you know, sure. which one of the oldest Cistercian monasteries. Amazing. It's awesome. And, um, but think about the fact that there were many, many people who were sincerely looking for communion with the divine. Yeah. Who were involved in those activities. I mean, the peaceful ones. And I'm not talking about, you know, the rapacious wars and, and uh, uh, genocides and i mean you know the one that really kills me whenever i think about it it practically sends me i mean it makes my blood pressure go up it's what i think about you know how they killed all the buffalo and right. I think, you know those pictures of those mountains of buffalo skulls and i just practically you know you know it's unreal it's crazy so but then i get the same reaction when i see you know what people are doing to to steal ivory from elephants i mean right it, you know, they butcher the elephant while it's alive, practically, just to take their tusks. It's incredible. So, you know, that is something that is, it's part of the human condition of the suffering that is being generated by false teachings and by leaders who lead people astray because people under normal circumstances, you know, like we were saying the other day, you know, a large majority of people wouldn't be involved in these kind of things if they were left to their own devices, you know. Right. So I try to get over that because it is utterly horrible, but it is just another event, another event. I mean, my son-in-law is Irish and he grew up uh, during a lot of the time of the, the troubles. You know, he's, he's Irish Catholic. And, you know, that the whole English occupation of Ireland and the persecution of the Irish Catholics and, all of that sort of thing. And, and sometimes they had to endure all kinds of assaults and insults from uh, some of the Northern Irish people that, that uh, were British. And, you know, I mean, he, he, he's scarred by it. But, you know, that's just another incident. And then, I mean, you just keep going back through history deeper and deeper and deeper. And you see just... It's just a mountain. I mean, that's why I had a chapter in in secret uh, in the wave called the terror of history. Yeah. You really history. It's terrifying. It's terrible, it's and you have to study and you have to dig into it and you have to look at it. And <clears throat> once you do that, then then you're able to kind of let go of each individual thing. You know, I went through the same phase. You know, that's why. I was that's why I researched the Cathars and the witch persecutions and all of those things, because, you know, I was fueling, fueling my rage because I was fueling my justification for having abandoned my faith. Right. Right. Um, but, at the, you know, at, at a certain point, I kept going back and back and back and got deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and I kind of got over it to the point where I could see the value and the benefit of some aspects of Christianity. Um, I can't say a whole lot for Judaism because Judaism is really an invented religion. If you, if you, read, yeah. if you read the, uh, the works of Gmerkin and Wesalius and Van Cedars and uh, McDonald and all of the, uh, the Copenhagen School of Biblical Research, you just realize that, you know, it was invented and it was, and it was, imposed on the Jews around the time of the Maccabees. So they really don't have this long history as depicted in the Old Testament. It just doesn't exist. And they, they, they imposed this religion on the Jews at the time of the Maccabees, and it was to justify the Maccabean you know, revolution and 
you know, acquisition of more and more territory, you know, genocide. Well, those people over there, they're our ancient enemies because look, it's here in this book, you know, so we are justified to go and wipe them out because they're, you know, God gave us this land and we're going to take it back. And that's what they're doing right now. I just, you know, the same thing. again. <laughs> but anyway, the real error that occurred in Christianity was when the author of Mark cast Paul as Jesus, you know, because the Jesus character in the Gospel of Mark is modeled on Paul largely. And all of the events and uh, the sayings and so forth in the Gospel of Mark, which is the first Gospel, the one that was ripped off by the other two, are um, examples or allegories of Pauline teaching. And the thing is, is it was written right after the war, basically to get the Jewish Christians off the hook because they were, you know, they had been following a Messiah who was a revolutionary and they were in danger of their lives. And this, this was designed to make it look like you know, Christians are peaceful people. Jesus was a peaceful guy, you know. But all of the Christians who were of that generation knew the score. They knew the difference between Judas the Galilean and Paul. They knew the difference between the Pauline Christianity and the Jerusalem Christianity. They knew this was an allegory. They knew that, you know, Paul had been proven to be right and the Jerusalem Christians had been proven to be wrong because they were declaring that the Messiah was going to come and kick some Roman butt and put them on, you know, in the in the in the top seat. And it didn't happen. And so there is an enormous so so the imposed Pauline theology on the stories, on the characters, and used the characters, and they brought them in and and they have wonderful uh, mimetic effects or episodes in there where you can look at it and you can read where it was taken from, say, um, you know, Homer or, you know, Odyssey or, you know, whatever. And so this person did this. He wrote it. He cast, he created the character Jesus of Nazareth. And he created him to represent Paul as, you know, the good guy. And the disciples, as as the as the bad guys, the Jerusalem Christians, because if you notice in the in the book of Mark, the disciples are they're, they're idiots. They right. fall don't understand out. anything Jesus says. They, yeah, they don't understand anything. And at the end of the act, the natural end of Mark, if you get back to the oldest text, they are never redeemed. That's right. They, they disappear during the crucifixion and they never come back again. And as far as Paul was concerned, you know, they were the bad guys, you know, and, he, and they had their natural names as they lived in real life. But the, the, the most jarring thing about the whole thing is that the betrayer is named Judas, which was the name of the original uh, Messiah of the Jerusalem Christians. <laughs> what a mind F. And it, it was, it was incredible, but everybody knew it. And when they were reading it or hearing it, they knew what was going on because they knew it was an allegory. They knew that this was very clear, right. clearly written and it's written in an, an incredibly complex ring composition that just blows your mind when you see it laid out for you. And in order to see that, you know, just just check out Marianne Tolbert's book because she she shows she demonstrates the ring composition. And I put in the back of um, from Paul to Mark, there is an example of this ring composition of, from her book. So, yeah. Then what happened? Matthew came along and he decided, that, and he was more influenced by Jerusalem Christianity than Pauline Christianity. So he wrote Matthew, and he corrected Paul. And you can see where he corrected Paul and broke his structure. I mean, this, this can be seen. 
And he also added the uh, the birth narrative, which is, you know, that's a, another borrowed story. And well, that's everywhere, though. By the way, that's like in so he he stole that from so many ancient texts and different cultural, you know. Exactly. So he came along, and then a little later on, Luke came along and tried to reconcile the Matthean and the Markan Christianities. You know, to, or to make and try to make it appear that everybody had been getting along from the beginning. So he wrote um, the book of Acts, which is really rips off a whole lot of Josephus. So that's the big error. They created Jesus of Nazareth, and everybody at the time who knew the joke, who knew the irony of it, had passed away. Right. And they began, and a bunch of people came along who began to think that this was the truth. They, the, the generation that understood what had been written and how it had been written and why it had been written was gone. And they began to believe that it was true. And they began to invent even more stories. And, you know, the whole industry was off and running. <clears throat> so the, if you want to blame somebody for the whole thing, you know, blame the author of Mark. I mean, I don't know who he was. Nobody is. There's some that think it was a woman even. But I don't, I, it was such a complex text. And the time in which it was written, you know, I think they needed something done fairly quickly because they were in a parlous condition. I mean, the, the Romans were really, really hostile towards the Jews at that moment because of all the, all of the things that happened in the war. So, it may have taken a committee or a group of editors to put it together. Um, unless, and here's a possibility, people back then were way smarter than we give them credit for and somebody could sit down and write out a plan to, to write a text like this and then put it together with that kind of uh, compositional parameters. That well, what, if, what, what if they were also, what if they also right. were, in that relation, time traveling, or had access to tra time travel technology, and we're putting together an elaborate. Why would they? Need, why would they need that? I mean, it's a, I mean, I really, honestly, don't know. But I mean, you, you, well, so I was going to bring this guy up. I mean, I'm it's sure more parsimonious. It's more parsimonious to, to say, you know, to look at the facts that are really available. Right. And say, this is what happened. I mean, there's all kinds of stories about, you know, Saint Issa and India and Jesus here and Jesus there and all. I've read all that stuff. It's garbage. It's pure garbage. That's what I was going to ask you about. So before I get to Michael Heisler, uh, the great biblical historian of the unseen realm. Um, so Yeshua Ben Joseph, the name that the Essenes gave the man, was that a real person? Where do you, where do you get the information that the Essenes named somebody Yeshua Ben Joseph. Ah, uh, just a bunch of different books that I've read. Um, one was, of them was, did you uh, did you read the, uh, the the text from Qumran? The text of the Qumran? Um, no, just parts of it. I mean, not the actual, but I mean, I have read the Nag Hammadi scripts. Um, that, that's a completely different story. Those were Gnostic texts, not completely. Right. You know, I mean, they're related in a certain way to the sure. Qumran text. But there's no Yeshua ben Joseph. I mean, that's just the way, I mean, in the gospel it says, in the gospel of Matthew, it right. said there was Jesus and his father was God, but his mother had to marry somebody, so she married Joseph, and it was called Jesus. So, you know, modern day people have said, well, Jesus is really Yeshua, which is true, and his father was Joseph, so we'll call him Yeshua ben Joseph. Not and they started doing that, and then they started associating him with the Essenes and writing all kinds of crazy and insane uh, fantasies. It's like fa uh, fan, what do they call it, fan fiction? Where like yeah. the fans will take a fiction book and then they'll just yeah, write, I'm write on top of it. I'm looking for the book. It was a, um, it was a Dolores Cannon book. Oh yeah, I think that that one book Jay that we read was called Jesus and the Essenes, which I think was like a channel text or something. Yeah, it was where a they talked text. about Yeshua ben Joseph as being this guy. Of course, I can't. I think there was also it. some 
I think there was some also Rudolf Steiner stuff that maybe, and I may be misquoting that, but he may have mentioned there was like these two different Jesus characters that like grew up, but I don't know. A lot of his stuff doesn't make sense to me. So. I'll tell you if, if whenever you read that kind of stuff and, and if, if, you know, I read all that stuff and it wasn't until I did the actual hands-on deep digging, dirty research that I did and I put it all in this darn book and you read it, Hunter. Yeah. So you know what it is. You know how hard that book is. That that is not an easy book to read. Or I'll be done by the next call, our next podcast. I promise. It's amazing. It's amazing that you can rely on. Right. Is yeah. in that book. Everything. Yeah. I mean, everything. When you read about things, I mean, like Edgar Casey and his thing about Jesus and so on and so forth, and you wonder, well, if there were psychic and and they were picking up these things, you know, where did they come from? Well. I tell you, if for over a thousand years or 1600 years or however long it is, there have been a whole lot of people believing this and creating these patterns in the, in the electromagnetic fields of the earth. And somebody right. just searches, you know, within the, the, uh, what would you call it? The third density attached ethereal realm or something. They're going to find that they're going to see it and they're going to get all kinds of things from it, you know? And that was one of the reasons why I, determined I needed to get to a source that went beyond that because I knew we were encircled in a cloud of lies, you know, and the only way you're going to get a perspective on it is to get really, you know, find a contact that is beyond that, you know, keep pushing because two years we spent in this experiment looping through all kinds of, uh, entities that wanted to give us their their take on things and their uh their understanding or they were just dead dudes and they didn't know what they were talking about i mean you know it's just we went we kept records of everything every everything that uh transpired and you know what you have to do is once you can evaluate what it is and you have to evaluate that based on knowledge and you re- you reject them, you send them away, and then okay, next, next. Right. And I mean, it was like you know this endless stream. And then I think finally, after two years, somebody up there realized that I was serious and I wasn't going to accept anything that didn't give an indication that it was something higher. And as you know, on the night the seas came through, and this was also the night of the first impacts of Comet Shoemaker Levy on Jupiter, uh, there was this big explosion sound in the sky, a clear blue, a, a clear blue black sky, you know, dark. It was dark outside, but it was a clear sky. Shook our house like crazy. Things fell off shelves and stuff. And then all of a sudden the seas introduced themselves. And that was, you know. That was how it happened. Well, Laura, so, oh, go I, ahead. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you because this kind of connects the wave to Paul and Mark a little bit. So in the wave, and I forget exactly which book, there's this idea of the quest for the Holy Grail and the Sangreal and all this going on. How, when you were writing Paul to Mark, what's going on with the Holy Grail? Because obviously, as we know now, much of this in Paul to Mark is completely separate. So like, not separate, but I guess just kind of a different through line. What... In writing Paul to Mark, what would you say now? And because you wrote a lot of that in the wave a while ago, um, to the Holy Grail, and like how does that connect to kind of your conclusion of Paul to Mark? Well, you know, things like ideas about the Holy Grail, well, those were of course created. I mean, ideas of the Temple of Solomon, you know, the the Masons, all that kind of stuff. You know, there was no Temple of Solomon. Um, you know, they're when they're based on something that's fake then you can pretty well determine that, you know, that there's there's something going on here. And the Grail stories were, of course, uh, based on Christianity in a sense, but there was something else there. And there was something about a bloodline. And of course, that came through loud and clear. And so we went back not not too long ago, a few years ago, and asked about, uh, you know, so was, you know, was this bloodline the blood of, you know, the line of Julius Caesar? And 
you know, she said not especially, except insofar as he was a member of a bloodline of individuals connected to higher, uh, higher density beings, and that being the point of the bloodline. But my guess is because there were, you know, like stories of King Arthur, there are reflections of Caesar in the stories of King Arthur. And there are reflections of the stories of King Arthur in the stories of the Grail, you know, even though the Grail stories, you know, uh, came along probably a little earlier from the King Arthur stories. So when you start getting people, you know, pulling from these different traditions and putting things together, getting ideas and, and making up stories, I mean, it's like the way the gospel was written. They used all kinds of different sources to put something together to make a story. Uh, so I think people were aware that there is some kind of bloodline, there's some kind of difference, and I don't know if they were aware of it in a conscious way or if it was an unconscious awareness, or if there were some people who were psychic who were aware of it in a, in a stronger way, but I think there probably were. There were people who probably carried some of these secrets uh, down through the ages, and at the same time, there's also, you know, the other bloodline, what they call the, uh, the so-called reptilian bloodline, but it's not really reptilian it's 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 the negative nordics so uh that's you know what you have to watch out for first so yeah i you know i wrote a lot of stuff and and you can see the progression you know because i was learning as i was doing it right and the grail quest is still you know the archetypal quest mm -hmm. for you know, what we're looking for. And of course, you know, the, the grail is supposed to be some grail. I mean, that's been something somebody figured out, you know, holy blood. So it's a bloodline. It's not really, you're looking, you're not really looking for a, a chalice. But I did ask the C's one, one time and they, they gave a really peculiar answer. They said that I would see the grail. And my guess is, after the work we did in the last 10 years on our uh, electric universe things and seeing, you know, like uh, the Z-pinch plasma phenomena, believe me, if you see one of those in the sky, that thing's going to look like a freaking holy grail. And there was, a, if you haven't read Pierre's book about that, you probably ought to because there's, it's richly illustrated. It's got lots of pictures in there of plasma phenomena and the kinds of things that you would see, uh, things that even look like, you know, men or whatever. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, there's bits and pieces of truth that gets picked up and put in things. And because of my Christian upbringing, I am really dedicated to find you know, all the true pieces and putting them back together so that we have a clear, comprehensive picture of what the real deal is. What about when the C's talk about, because obviously I can't remember what book it was. I think it was book four or five. Might have even been somewhere in book three. Um, where that when they, you know, when people ask about Jesus and they talk about how like whenever they feel they're afraid or they're, they're around dark forces or, you know, whatever, demons reptilians, whatever, um, if they, if they bring the name of Jesus or they utter the name of Jesus name that they feel protected or that the darkness or the enemy or the, the, the negative energy goes away. And I know, I remember the C said something about Jesus and Reiki. And that was one of the questions I was going to ask you today about Reiki, but like, what is the simulation of that? If Jesus is an, if it's just an allegory. Now say re rephrase that question. Well, so basically there was in, in one of the books, and I apologize, it was either three, four or five. There was a question about who was Jesus and C said that he was a real person, but that he was like a Reiki healer and that he did heal people. Well, they did, well okay, let's see, Reiki. And I, and I could be wrong. I'm going from memory, but I, I thought that they said he was something. Like Reiki. Right. And I said, yes. And if you think about it and you realize that Jesus was modeled on Paul and right. you read the Pauline epistles and he talks about miraculous events that occurred when he was with his congregations and things about healing and so forth and how they were 
so amazed by the things that happened when he was with them that, you know, that that's what inspired their faith, then, you know, you can see that being partly restricted by our belief systems, the C's are going to answer as truthfully as they can answer sure. with the restriction that's coming from us. And, but yet you see, if you look at all of the instances where they talk about Jesus, you will find that they were gradually leading us to a different understanding. Got it. We ask him, did he have any children? And he said, yes. And who did he have these children with? Three Roman women. I mean, where would that come from? Why would Jesus, you know, a, a, a backwoods Jew, Supposedly, you know, according Supposedly. to the ghost, you know, be lollygagging around with Roman women. Uh uh. Yeah. So they were gradually leading us to that understanding within the capabilities of our openness, you know, and our openness increased as time went by. Um, but as for as for Reiki, you know, I I asked the question, was it something like Reiki? Because of course I had just discovered reiki and, and i thought this was pretty cool and it and, and it, you know would we ever be able to do that and they said if you're if you obtain that kind of purity well you know are when they're talking about jesus are they talking about paul or are they talking about caesar right you know and then when they talk about you know the soul in in fifth density that's able to replicate itself and send this portion of its rep or this replication to the believer who's praying to help them and strengthen them. You know, who is that? Is that Paul or is that Caesar? I don't know. Uh, I suppose I could ask that specific question. You know, I'll, I'll put it on the I just wrote that down. There's a question. <laughs> put it on the list. And uh, you must have a really long list. <laughs> oh, I had so many questions. And, you know, I finally got to the point where. Well, you know, we have these sessions where we have like 100 people present on, on Zoom and I'll open the, open the floor and let them ask questions. Yeah. And, uh, but every once in a while we have a private session because there are things that I am particularly interested in. I don't want to be interrupted, you know? Sure, of course. And uh, so I think that um, Reiki is... Yeah, and you know, I I do Reiki attunements. So, you know, most of the members of our group I I've, I've attuned Reiki, and uh, a whole bunch of them. And we even, you know, all the all the people in the house are Reiki masters because I made them that way. <laughs> so but didn't didn't the C's tell you? Because I know you asked, and again, I apologize. I'm going from memory too. Um, you have such a prodigious amount of information. I don't even know how your brain is just incredible. But um, didn't they say that it was a higher density form of healing? Did the actual Reiki? No, they didn't say exactly that. No, but they, I thought said, they said the symbols were something that we couldn't understand yeah. or ancient or something. Yeah, correct? They, you know, they said that. And they also, um, at a certain point, I, I had this idea and I asked for crop circles, kind of like, you know, Reiki for the right. planet. Right. And if I remember correctly, they I think they said something like or they approved that possibility. I've got too many returns on the word Reiki and in, in the transcript, so I'm not gonna go searching through them now. Yeah, I think that's what you're right. I think you're right. I I, I, I pretty I've got a pretty good recall of that that it was it was signals that that when you went deeper, they said your crop circles. Yeah, you would uh yeah, and the thing about the Reiki symbols is that they transmit information into right. your energy field. Right. And um, and that is what I think crop circles do. They transmit in, in, information into the Earth's energy field. So, yeah, I think crop circles are great. Uh, so. Have you ever been out to a crop circle? No. Yeah, me neither. I have never been to the UK. I mean, I know it's close and I know I could go if I wanted to, you know, and my my son in law, my daughter go fairly regularly up to Ireland because his parents are there. Uh, but you know, I mean I don't want to go there for some reason. Well, before we end before we stop talking about and I'm sure we'll cross over to it again, various other topics, but before we just leave the whole religious teachings, 
two, two things, uh, the Vatican, your thoughts on the Vatican, what's really there, what's going on there. And then how all the other Abrahamic offshoots, you know, Islam, especially, is there any differentiation or is it really just all the same thing? Is it just, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that? Well, like I said, Pauline Christianity was real. Right. But what it was transformed into, yeah, and of course, the author of the Gospel of Mark tried to teach Pauline Christianity through the medium of an allegory, the Gospel of Mark. But then what happened, you know, with, you know, Matthew and Luke and Acts and all the things that came after, um, you know, it was just totally perverted and it became a Jewish thing. I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, if Julius Caesar was Paul's Christ, and I, I, I really believe he was, and I think I've made the case. Hunter, did I make the case? Oh, absolutely. Well, when I was done with the book, I was just thinking about it and contemplating it. And I said, I don't know that you could dispute that, especially like just from the evidence that you present, it's much more clear that that's the case than it was this figure of Jesus of Nazareth. There's much, much more supporting evidence that it was Julius Caesar. If you look at the story arc of his life and the way that Paul wrote, that it was him rather than this mythical character that was like under Pontius Pilate. And then also, too, you have the Josephus and what you wrote about him in the beginning of this guy that was just basically like a trickster that we're validating so much of our history through. And then he realized he was just a guy too that was writing stuff. I did want to ask you about that. Like, how did you come to discover that Josephus was basically more or less just this like trickster that was kind of like out for his own good that was just kind of piecing stuff together across his life? I read his text. I read his autobiography. You know, <laughs> it, it. he's so slimy. Like Elon Musk autobiography? I'm sorry, I had to say that. <laughs> If the scholars know it, they talk. I mean, how many of them did I quote? They all know it because they read yeah. it too. It's yeah. a slime ball, you know? Yeah. And, you know, the most interesting thing I found as far as I'm concerned was the, those two stories in Josephus that I'm convinced Josephus was in dialogue with Paul. You know, the story of, uh, of Paulina and Fulvia. Yeah. So those are, you know, the two things that are really astonishing. But, yeah, I laid it all out in there, and I put it all together. And then what happened is, you know, like I said, Christianity got perverted, and you could say that uh, Paul's Messiah was a Gentile. And he had precedence for that because Cyrus the Great was considered to be a Messiah, selected by God. And Paul based his selection, his belief in this, on that material on, on the fact that Cyrus was uh, considered to be a messiah. And he and he, this comes through clearly in his epistles when he talks about, you know, who is the potter to, who is the, who is the pot to say to the potter, why have you made me thus? And basically uh, quoting directly from Isaiah when he's talking about Cyrus the Great. So um, you can say that here that the Jews stole the Gentile Messiah and made him Jewish. And oh, they attached the Old Testament to, you know, Christianity, you know, thinking that, you know, this is this is going to be the nice thing to do. And, of course, people have said that the reason they did that was to give it, uh, to give it cachet, you know, or antiquity. And that's not really the case because... Uh, the first gospel or the first Bible was the Bible of Marcion, which had a, you know, and a, a bunch of epistles of Paul and a, a gravely redacted gospel that was very much like the gospel of Mark, but it wasn't exactly, it, are, it had already been edited. And he firmly believed, you know, to read, you know, that the Old Testament had nothing to do with, had no place in Christianity. None whatsoever. And he was getting so many converts that uh, the Roman church 
decided they had to co-opt Paul to their own purposes. So they started manufacturing documents and, and, and things that said, oh, well, you know, Paul was this or Paul was that and so forth. And, of course, the book of Acts was written, which, you know, kind of amalgamated everything. But, and all of that's in From Paul to Mark. You'll learn about all of that stuff in there. But then you t consider Islam. Islam, you know, talks a lot about Christianity. So it's based largely on the Old Testament, which is it's kind of it's kind of like it's found in you know, Abraham, Abrahamic religions, which is Judaism and Islam. Right. And, and partly on the New Testament or, or the Jesus story, as, as they understood it. I, there wasn't a, you know, a New Testament as we have now. Well, actually there was because they came along fairly late. So there was a New Testament. So they were co-opting Abraham and the Jews and Jesus and the Christians, you know, to be part of their foundation. So, you know... So the only thing true you get out of all of it is Paul's Christianity, Paul's theology. And Paul's theology was very interesting. You know, I've, I've gone through and elucidated it as much as is possible. And it kind of, um, it kind of, you know, coincides or dovetails with things that he said, because it's all about seeing the unseen. Well, I was going to ask you that too. You can obviously tell he has pretty good awareness. What do you think Paul's understanding of the hyperdimensional control matrix was? Because there's obviously some through lines of that in his letters. Compared to our interpretation of it today, do you think he was very aware or just kind of like was grasping at something that he knew was there? I think he was pretty aware. I, I think he was pretty aware. I mean, Ephesians six twelve. You know, it's not against you know forces of flesh and blood we do battle, but against you know principalities and powers and darkness and high places. I mean, he talked isn't that about, crazy? You're right. They said high places. Wow, that just I just had this. Joke. Well, and I think too. So I, I wanted to ask you. I have so many questions, but the so Paul, you have this guy that in a lot of his writings is dismantling circumcision and these ritualistic sacrificial practices of Jews, what would appear to be Jews and Jewish Christians. And to me, that is more or less the reptilian nature, because if you look back and I don't know how true this is now that I know about the the Old Testament really being rewritten from Greek stuff from the you know Library of Alexandria, but was he trying to dismantle what was probably a reptilian uh, kind of like through line of the old testament of these things and he was saying no this is the wrong way you don't sacrifice things you don't do all this stuff so i've always wondered that because it was like christians will comport the old testament or conflate the old testament and new testament together but you, if you look at paul he's trying to say that everything in the old testament is like invalidated uh because of sacrifice and all these like ritualistic well, practices well, well, well before you answer laura what is the purpose of circumcision anyway i mean you, you know you hear the stories of the rabbis which suck the blood you know out you know, in the ancient days, in the wave, it's in there. No, I know, but like, what was it though? I mean, I mean, what is the real reason for it? I mean, other than reptilian mind control, it makes a man hate women, right? Because he's not for, I mean, eight days old, he is at a moment of imprint vulnerability. Okay. You know, somebody comes along and whacks his pee pee, and don't tell me it doesn't hurt and the babies don't feel pain because let me tell you what. I it's was a horrific trauma, horrific trauma. Sitting in the doctor's office when it was done to a little baby boy. And I, I was, I nearly passed out from horror at the screams that, that child made. And, and you know, they, they, they said for years and years that babies don't feel pain. Yeah, and it, yeah. You know, my uh, my ex husband's nephew was operated on as an infant, open heart surgery, and all they gave him was paralytics. Jesus. And I just every time I think about it, I just go absolutely nuts. But anyhow, you take and you whack a kid's pee pee when he's at this point of imprint vulnerability, and it makes him literally a slave. Because when that goes along with all of the uh rules and regulations and so on and so forth and he already knows how bad it's gonna hurt if he does something bad because what can an infant think 
Right. What well, happens to them? Except, what did I do? I mean, even they can't really even articulate that because they don't have enough, uh, you know, fully developed consciousness to think. But it's like the world out there is one scary freaking place. You know, yeah. this is this is horrible. This is horrible. And when you're when you're given that impression that the world is a horrible, horrible place. Got it. And you grow up with all of these rules and regulations and you mix that together. What a horrible place it is. I guess I've never really understood why some people didn't circumcise. I mean, obviously I do now, but like, because it seems like everyone at this point is under some form of auspicious mind control across religions, across spiritual beliefs and teachings. Why would some people not just because of that, because they didn't want their child to experience the, the pain and the torture of it? Or are there some actual spiritual teachings out there that know what it's really about? Well, originally circumcision was, uh, was a, a rite performed on priests and priests of a lot of different types of religions in the, in the Near East in those ancient times. That's and so the rules and regulations that were given to the Jews were generally the same kind of rules and regulations that were imposed on priests of different religions. And there were religions that castrated themselves. And in a sense, um, circumcision is, is kind of like, a, 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 what would you call it? A, uh, a symbolic castration so that they can serve the God. And of course, you have to think about that in, in some really weird terms, because if they're being symbolically castrated, being turned into eunuchs, you know, does that suggest a homosexual relationship right. between right. them and God? Um, or are they, you know, trying, trying to be their first transgender, transgenders, you know, they're, they're all trying to be women. Um, I don't know. But the thing is, is that these rites and rituals and customs were, were priestly. And so, you know, of course, the Bible says, you know, my my people will be a nation of priests. You know, they're all going to be priests, and and they ended, and and I'm sure that that was a lizard inspired um, coup on the Jewish people. You know, because now we'll get you, we'll we'll get you circumcised, and we'll make you terrified of the world at large. You know, in your most infantile inner parts. And then we'll impose all these rules and regulations on you. And then, you know, whatever we slide into the, into the commands later on, if we do. And you will show, and you shall have no other gods besides me. So, so then the question, obviously, I know you're thinking it right now, Hunter, as I am, is like, who is Yahweh? <laughs> well, I don't know. Didn't the C say he was like a reptoid or yeah. a reptoid? Yeah, they did. Well, that was so the book that you just read, which, you know, you pretty much viscerated Paul, you know, he, he talks about his last book in, in book the, before the one that I sent you his previous one of the Eden series, he, he said that Yahweh was a was a reptile was a giant reptilian being. Well, he's right on that, but he's yeah. just wrong thinking. I mean, yeah. he's, he's trying to, I don't know, write apology for aliens. Right. You know, I'll finish the book. I mean, I I set it aside after I read that because it upset me. I, no, I understand. I mean, I, I, Paul, if you met Paul, you like Paul. He's a genuinely good guy, and he was a brainwashed Episcopalian minister for a very long time, and now he's not. But you know, he's obviously like everybody else, attempting to piece things together, and he's missing missing some big points. But so there you go, Hunter. Who was the guy? Well, go ahead. Who was the guy that wrote the book, Hunter? You and I read about the, he was the CIA. Uh, uh, analyst dragons of Eden, not dragons of Eden, but what was the name of that book? And he said, flying that, serpents and dragons. I think it was flying R serpent R and dragons. R. A. Boulet, which was obviously a pen name. R. A. Boulet. Have you seen that book, Laura? Oh, send me, send me a link to it or something. Then an I will for sure. So he said the same thing. He said that, that, that they were, he said that the, he said that Leviticus was a cookbook. Well, and I, that it was, that, that it was literally for reptilians it, it was it was teaching humans how to prepare their quote unquote sacrifices for their for the reptilian gods who were coming to eat them. But the laws, other than the food laws, you know, were ripped off directly from Plato, almost word for right. word. Yeah, you know, read read Merkin's book on it. I mean, side by side, you can see where 
All those laws were just ripped off. I mean, that was pretty sure it was an ideal society. So like, how far back do you think when they were actually walking amongst us? Because obviously timelines, that's a whole other question for you but about timelines. Clearly, in order for them to walk amongst us, we would have to be in a, a kind of a force density environment, wouldn't we? Right. And that's the sticking point. And that's why I think that, you know, like in the Sumerian stories, they talk about um, Ioannis, who would come up out of the sea and go back into the sea, and he would, you know, bring them information and so forth, and he had the, you know, fish tail or legs, legs that were like fish scales or something, um, that that would indicate that there was some difficulty in remaining in third density, and that's something we've already talked about a little bit. Yeah. Um, and then there, there are other stories, you know, where somebody appeared and told people things, you know, taught them things. So I'd say that walking among us is not necessarily requisite for them to be ruling over us almost sure. directly, as long as they have, you know, viceroys in place and you and, I mean, I, I'm willing to bet Klaus Schwab is one of the reptilian viceroys. I mean, if you've seen crazy outfits like that, put some on. <laughs> Jesus. It's almost like they rub it in your face, you know? It's just like, <laughs> for the if you're if you're aware to it, it's almost like it's, this, it's overkill. It's like you don't even have to be that blatant with it to understand what's going on. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's crazy. So I, I would say... I don't know, didn't the sea say that it was six or seven thousand years ago or something yeah. along that line? Yeah. <clears throat> which, which would make sense, at least from the written history that we have from some I, would, I used to be able to, you know, pull anything out of my head just like that. But you know, the last couple of years after I've been suffering all this, you know, all this trauma, uh, with my husband being sick, you know, I just kind of like went into what kind of parking mode, you know, for a couple of years, just taking care of him and getting over that. And uh so I, I'm working now on resharpening my brain. Uh, it's still pretty sharp, razor sharp. <laughs> Not like it used to. Laura, be. one thing, one thing I know Jay and I have I talked about this before. We didn't write this down. So you have these characters like uh, Thoth or Toth and Hermes and Apollo and all these people that I think in the New Age we get told are these like benevolent aliens that come and they give us information that like helps uplift humanity what do you think about that i think maybe some of them are i mean you know there are there are some good guys they're just you know they they the good guys don't uh don't violate free will and you know if if you're not in a situation where you're really really asking and really calling out and it's really sincere and it's really burning inside you uh, to the point that you're willing to work as hard as you can to do everything you can on your own. And then when you finally get to the end of that, then you say, I give up, help me, you know, and then you knock on the door and you keep on knocking and knocking and then they may answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I always kind of feel a little bizarre when somebody says, Oh, I sat down and meditated with a, little pyramid on my head one day and I just downloaded, you know, an, an ancient spaceman and he started talking through me and boom, I got a new cult following. <laughs> you know, that's not how the good guys work. It's definitely not. You have to really, really ask and you have to do your own work because if, if there's anything the Caesar are sticklers about, it's about doing your work. And they say, right. no pain, no gain. And if we right. hand it to you like, you know, Halloween candy, it won't benefit you. You know, things that you learn on your own through your own effort are become part of you. You know, I mean, it actually builds your, your magnetic center. And it's, it's just a really important principle. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that segue is perfect to what the, one of the other big topics that we wanted to cover with you today, which is, I'll just read it out. And this is from all the books, but knowledge acquisition which leads to awareness is our greatest form of protection mm -hmm. third density service to self beings. And I think for the listening audience, I think it's important to understand that <clears throat> third density is essentially a fallen realm. And in a fallen realm, we have a choice 
to be either in service to self or as a service to others candidate. Because as you very accurately, according, you know, through your information from the seas, point out every second that we are in survival in a physical body, right? We have to eat, we have to breathe, we have to sleep, we have to do all these things that we wouldn't do if we were just at base essence energy beings. And so I think it's important for humans to understand, for all of us to understand that we are in service to self, just at a default state in third density. Yeah, absolutely. And knowledge acquisition um, is the thing is is one of the main things. It's it, it's a foundational thing because everything else comes from that. If you know something, if you know something about physiology, if you know something about medicine, if you know something about religion, if you know history, knowing history is probably one of the, really one of the more important things. Totally, in my opinion, because history is my passion, but. Uh, I think because then, you know, when somebody presents you with a book and it's got all this stuff and you know, and, and when I, when I say learning history, I don't mean just reading your average history book. I mean, getting back to some of the text, the original text, and then being able to discern when somebody is pulling your leg and when they're not, you know, reading uh, archaeological reports on mm -hmm. site, you know, what they find. Uh, how they found it and all the details about that, you know, any period you're interested in, you should, you should go to the direct text from which the author of a modern book is, is getting his, uh, his information. And then also look at the archeology, span see if it supports what they're saying. Um, you, in medicine and, you know, healthcare, uh, psychology, so on, and also use use common sense. Common sense is is greatly underrated these days. Uh, not much of it, but you can't fix stupid. Um, but knowledge, I mean, if you can if you can think of anything when knowledge wouldn't help you, I'd like to know what it is. Right. I mean, like for example, flat Earth people. <sighs> That's a massive sigh up. I mean, yeah, and it, there's a whole lot of people who learned that there are conspiracies in the last few years because of COVID who have come out of the COVID period as newly minted conspiracy right. theorists. We're and awake. The, and, and the first thing they latch on to is like, you know, flat earth. And, you know, they talk about how you get images that are pictures or whatever that are put in the windows of the planes when you fly well you know what i've flown on private planes and you get on a private plane and you know what's on the window and you know what's you know inside and you can even put down the window sometimes if you want to or you know open the window in some way so you know you're not seeing a projected image yeah and you know that when you see the curvature of the earth from your altitude that it's real you know so yeah so do you think <clears throat> flat earth you could you could insert any other like crazy right. stuff do you think those are inbuilt rebound mechanisms of the matrix it's like a rubber band that when people try to expand their knowledge so there's you just have a person there they're waking up okay everything the conspiracy is the only reality now is the earth is it round or is it flat does the does this like dualistic paradigm that they get sucked into is that a way to keep them back Jacques inside the fence, so to speak. Yeah, Jacques Vallée wrote about that in one of his books. He talked about, he called it the nuclear train principle. You know, when somebody is gets a train, gets on a train to truth, the truth train, you know, the bad guys come along and they dump some nuclear fuel in it and set it going so fast that it's, you know, destined to run right off the track because it can't sustain that kind of speed. So people get on these truth trains and then they go off the track because, you know, because they are handed something that is the nuclear fuel, which is some kind of a conspiracy theory or idea that is so completely off base or, or misleading that it takes, it takes them completely out of the realm of, of truthfulness and acquiring knowledge. So, yeah, that's, uh, that really happens with the, the that 
No, that's another question I had about the matrix. Cause it's funny that you mentioned a lot of times that you would describe much of what was revealed in the matrix movie series, whatever, you know, that was whoever commissioned it or whatever. But, uh, when you came to that, was it like, Hey, we had uh, these ideas first and then they were put into this movie because it was, I think if you read a lot of your work before that, you were describing kind of the same thing that was going on. Yeah. When we watched that movie, I just, yeah, I was electrified. I was like, geez, it's, it's all exactly what the seas have been describing. My God. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it, it just blew me away. I'm sure they stole from you. I mean, look, the story, the truth is, let's just be honest. I mean, both of those uh, writers slash directors, whatever they're with their names now, they became women. They did? Yeah, yeah they're, they're like the biggest leaders that? of like the transgender. Oh, yeah. Uh, you didn't movement. know about that? Yes. I know that. Yeah, yeah the two I'll send you, I'll send you a whole writers giant and deep dive that. article on it. It's insane. They they literally transgendered them. It was, it was like, almost like, okay, we're gonna give you this fame and funny and or fame and money and fortune, and you are also gonna follow along with what we tell you. I mean, they're they're like a caricature of this what we're talking about, what your books are talking about in the wave. It's incredible. I didn't know that. I'm sorry yes. to hear that because that was yeah, that was one hell of a movie. I don't know what the follow-up movies were about because I didn't watch the follow-up. The last one was absolutely horrific. I don't like horror knockoff. In movie, they usually ruin it. You know? I thought the second one was good. The third was eh, and then the last one, the the newest one, was a total rip-off knockoff. But I mean, in the second one, there were a lot of codes and words and stuff. There was there's a lot of deep symbolism in both the first and the second. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the one thing I really didn't like was. Uh, they depicted being awake and aware as you know, like this all this underground subterranean no shot. Yeah. distance where they eat this horrible stuff, you know, like <laughs> oatmeal or and they're living on some kind of shit. Whoa. Yeah. And and I don't think that that's what it should be like because you know, when you when you finally do begin to really see the unseen. It's like your world expands. It doesn't contract to something like that. That's that's the one thing I didn't really like about it. Um, it otherwise the metaphors were just were, were, they were just fantastic, you know. I I just wish I had one of those gadgets where you can you know plug it in the back of your neck and yeah download stuff. I mean, well, you know, I mean, I mean, if you, if you look at what's happened to both of them, Hunter, what were the names of the directors? I can't the, what, the Wachowski, the brothers. Wachowski brothers. So it's yeah. like, it's proof that they were given access to higher density information to, 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 to you know, to, 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 to do that. And, and, and again, it's not, again, if you, if, how, how I say it is if you're familiar with the wave series and, and unfortunately there aren't enough people, but by the time these podcasts, get out there more people will become familiar with them but to me that's proof that they were given information from your books plus whoever helped them in directing in hollywood because obviously we know hollywood is like a portal to these places um because now they're just carrying out this transgender you know ideal and and and, and 10 years later 15 years later it's bizarre i think you, when you're saying that, it just triggered a thought in my head that the, the reality they're depicting of being red pilled is probably the reptilian reality. Right, right. See, so there was there was some evidence of where it was coming from, and the seeds have said that the you know these fourth density negative uh, beings, what of whatever form they are, uh, they can be starkly accurate. Yes when it serves their agenda and you know they they presented being red pill red pilled as being extremely unpleasant and everybody else you know was still living in the matrix and enjoying their steaks and and so forth while those poor guys on the, on the little ship whatever i forget the name of it you know we're we're eating ugh, yucky gruel. Stuff. yeah gruel and living in probably looked like a, a sewer you know so i don't know so yeah there there's there's a lot to a lot to be said about that being inspired by negative forces 
And maybe they didn't get anything from my work. Maybe the negative forces gave it to them directly, you know, you know, kind of like a mind transfer thing and, you know, as a means to combat what I was doing. Right. So I did want to ask you about that too, Laura, in, in your personal life that you've written about in the books, it seems like some of these people get approached or come, they approach you in your circle and they obviously like wreak havoc based on what they do and they, they approach those friendly and then they kind of will have all of these actions. They end up taking against you and try to end up ruining you, which is really sad. What are these people consciously doing this or do you think they're commissioned from the other density to be like these like agent Smith, so to speak, where they're like directly trying to throw you off this path that you're on of discovering and publishing information? Well, in, in a couple of cases, it was direct and conscious, you know, like an MI6 agent. Yeah. Uh, and then there was, uh, you know, and I even wrote about it. There was a, a group of uh, uh, people who were on kind of like a, a truth and whatever network, and they approached us and, you know, offered us money and so forth. If we would join up with them, the only condition was we had to give up any connection to any of our esoteric work, you know, give up... <laughs> You know, remove all of that from the web. You know, I mean, remove it from the web. Yeah, I was supposed to, you know, remove it from the web, just let it die a death, and then I would be taken care of for life, and I would be part of this elite circle. And then I was, I wrote a series about a, a group that was peripherally involved with uh, child trafficking, or maybe not so peripherally, and they were on on the net, you know, with a whole bunch of new agey stuff. And that's when things got it started really getting. You know, like all the, all the lug nuts on my car were That's loose. crazy, by the way. Yeah. My fence was cut. Um, I was in the, that, you know, I told you we have a, a market in the, in the town every Thursday. And I went to market to, to, you know, buy vegetables and stuff. And there was a really strange guy and he kept looking at me and then, and then I turned around and he was taking pictures of me. <laughs> and then there was cars following me and, and you know, weird stuff. So for a long time and probably still most of the time, I never go anywhere alone anymore. Not no, you can't. Yeah. You know, I don't go anywhere alone anymore. And, uh, you know, the kids really, really protect me. You know, they don't, they don't let me do anything. And my husband really protects me. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm taken care of in that sense. And, but it's been weird. But there have been some others that I'm pretty sure there were some black magic types. You know, there have been a, several of them that were sent in, you know, pretending to be just, you know, something that they weren't. And then they, uh, then they just go all, you know, crazy. And then they start attacking, you know, it got so bad that this, this group of attackers that were just defaming me in, in an insane way ended up writing complaints about me to the French police. And then we got called in for police interrogations. And I mean, you know, I was in there for six hours being interrogated down at the police station in, in Toulouse. And my husband was interrogated. You know, we had to go every day for like a week because they were interrogating different people in the house and so forth. And the questions they asked made us know where this came from. Because, and, and it was ridiculous. I mean, like they told them I was wanted by the FBI. <laughs> I was wanted by the Pasco County. France. And they actually contacted the FBI and the Pasco County Sheriff's Department to find out if there was a warrant for my arrest. And, and you know, the woman finally admitted to this and, and said, well, you know, they said, no, that there's, they have no, nothing. And all the other claims that they made, you know, were just completely, you know, completely false. And they wanted to know where my yacht was, you know, and what other bank accounts did I have offshore bank accounts? <laughs> Yeah, all the kind of stuff. And God, it was just, it was insane. It was so stressful. So we just, 
you know, made photocopies of every bit of documentation we had. And it was a whole suitcase full. And we all took it down, you know, to show to them. And, and this, of course, came in conjunction with a fiscal audit, which it led to a two or three year battle between, because I appeal to the IRS because, you know, I'm not afraid. I file my taxes and I file yeah, taxes. Exactly. And we had two or three years between the IRS and the French Fisk fighting it out. Finally, the IRS caved. Yeah, how convenient that was. And then the French, you know, charged me this enormous uh, tax and penalty, which we ended up having to pay off over a period of time. I mean, it was it was so much we couldn't even pay it all at once. And then, um, well, yeah, it's 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 been real. It's been real. I mean, just I mean, just, you know, it's funny you just said all that because we've all undergone extortion for whatever reasons. But I mean, just the fact that we're paying the IRS or the French, whatever, and all these different companies just proves that we're just slaves. You know, as Charles Ford said, that, yeah. you know, this is somebody, you know, we're, the, the, the earth is a farm and we're someone else's servants or property. I mean, it's a fact. I mean, I mean, I mean, it, well, Hunter and I have this funny thing, Laura, that we say to, we, we, we've been playing this game for each other for years now. And I have another friend in Los Angeles now who just literally finally left California and moved to Nashville. But we would play a game with us. I mean, it's going back two decades. What is not a scam? T tell me what on this planet that is monetized is not some form of a scam when you break it down to its base essence. And it's like when, when a person becomes aware of all of this, you realize what Charles Fort realized. You realize what all of us have realized. You realize what other highly sentient aware beings become, that this is a setup for fourth density to literally feed off of us energetically and sometimes even physiologically, you know, depending on the decisions that we make and the level of awareness that we attain. It's true. And I'll tell you a couple of a story, just to give you an example. Uh, you know, Tom French and Cherie Diaz did the yep. article, right? And they had pictures in it. These people took one of the pictures of me that Cherie Diaz had, had, had photographed and it was published in the St. B Times. And I was sitting in a chair drinking a cup of coffee. Back in the days when I could drink coffee, I, I can't drink anymore. Anyway, um, and they published it on a website of defamation and claimed that there was me drinking whiskey because uh, yeah. I was an alcoholic. And then another, you were an alcohol they said you were an alcoholic. No, well, they said I was an alcoholic. You know, and wow. I've been, you know, for years. I mean, I I have a drink once in a while, like New Year's Eve or something. You know, a little champagne or whatever. And once in a while, I'll, depending on what's going on, if something really stressful happens, I'll take a shot of whiskey. But it's not like, you know, it, maybe five times a year it happens. And, but before that, I was a teetotaler for like many, many years, many years. And uh, that was my Christian up upbringing. You know, I even got upset when I married my husband and he wanted to put beer in the refrigerator. Yep. Poor guy. <laughs> <sighs> uh, but yeah, so we when we came to France, uh, my husband's friend and co-author uh, of a book on hyperdimensional physics he lives down in Marseille. And at the time, he was the director of CIRM, which is the Center in International Research Mathematique. And he invited Art to come down and give a, a presentation to him at a conference. So we went. While we were there, he invited us privately, him and his wife, to go out to dinner. And uh, so we went and then we got in their boat. They have a little, you know, like one of these Zodiac things. You know, they're like big rubber things, you know, giant motor on the back, speedboat. Mm -hmm. And we went out to some island off the coast of Marseille where there was a restaurant. We had dinner and we came back. And anyway, at the time, I was trying to keep all the, all the readers up to date on what we were doing. So I wrote about this trip to this to Marseille and, and what a nice time we had. And we went on on this boat ride with our friends and had dinner at a restaurant. Da da da. Described the food. you know travel log. Well, that within days that appeared on the defamers website as me 
uh, screwing my minions and going on a luxury <laughs> Mediterranean cruise. Screwing my minions. I love it. Today, yeah. you know, it's funny, Laura, is now today, if, if, if that story was today, they would do like a hundred, they would do a, what do you call it? Like a, a clipped profile of that with transcription, screwing over her minions with a picture. Yeah, exactly. It'd be like a news with on. like the captions, the auto captions and everything. <laughs> like a short, a short reel. A short Having reel of minions. Kind of treatment gave me a real taste for it. I mean, in the sense that I can, I can smell it when it's being done to somebody else. Right. Oh yeah. yeah. And that's, you know, when I see it being done to somebody else, I can, I, I know it. Which also begs the question too, Laura, how many of these people have the time to go do this? Because it's almost like a full-time job. I would say it's it a full-time is. job for them. It and is. Who are they getting paid by to be able to do that? And some of them apparently made a full-time job out of it. So they were obviously getting paid to do this. So I think that in, in a certain sense, I think some of them were conscious from a third density level that they were being paid by somebody, uh, you know, maybe the CIA right. to defend me because they don't want people knowing what the C's are saying. They don't want people to know what I've written. You know, they want to defame me and make people have this jerk reaction, cult, cult, cult. Or right. Well, Laura, we this, is, this, this is very important what you're saying right now, because I've already told you this and, and Hunter knows because I've shared it with him personally, but very, very well-known people in the quote unquote alternative esoteric truth community who, who, who know me, who I've had mess, you know, conversations with, this is going back a while now and I've completely stopped talking to them. They brought that up. Oh, she's a cult. You're a cult leader. <laughs> no. Like, I mean, I, I literally went back to these people like, what are you talking about? Have you read their books? But that's the problem is, I mean, read your books and read your work. Read books. Of, of course. course. Read them and they know that nobody else should read them because it might wake them up. Sadly, sadly, most people today don't read. I mean, it's, it, this is the bane of my existence. Like it was like, it seems like Gen X, a little bit of your generation, Everybody now, you know, there's outliers like Hunter from his generation, but like it does very few people read now. They all want videos. They want six second, 10 second attention span attraction. They don't get into the depths of this incredible, you know, esoteric prose and all the research you've done. But it's mind blowing because the people that came back to me are our age and are, you know, in the Gen X or baby boomer generation and they are readers. And for them to say that to me, it was just like, you're done. There's just, I, I literally, absolutely if you're not willing to read the, the work and you know you know richard dolan as you know wrote the amazing forward in your book by the way i was going to ask you is rich did richard read all of your stuff Seems i don't like he did. I, I think he read up to a certain point and then he and i talked and he, he got some of the particular information and he was so upset by it because to him it was such a horribly negative view of yeah, our yeah. reality that he couldn't stomach it. Well, that's you know? most people. And, you know? and that, that, yeah, that's what, that's what offends a lot of people. But if you keep in mind that knowledge protects and knowing about right. it and knowing what to do and how to take care of things, then you have some defense against that kind of marauding in your life. But if you don't, then you and your children and all your loved ones and your friends and everybody, you know, they are subject to those kinds of, uh, interdimensional mind manipulating uh num num you know eat them up uh marauding tr torment whatever so i mean i had small children too right, right. and re learning this sort of thing when you have small children and the first thing you think about is jesus christ how do i protect my children and i yeah. had to find ways to talk to them about it and not scare them too bad. And unfortunately, my oldest daughter was so upset by the whole thing. She says, don't tell me things I don't want to hear. And, you know, we don't have a relationship at this point because, you know, she doesn't, she doesn't want to know anything esoteric. It's like my wife says, we have to just let people be on the path. I want to read, I want to read though, Richard's preface, at the, the, just the end of it. You know, because obviously you definitely convinced him some way. He says the overall message, by the way, high strangeness. This is for high strangeness. But he says, 
But I know Richard, by the way, but he's the overall message of the book is grim. The situation is not hopeless. I am very much taken by the motto of the sea stated several times in the book. Knowledge protects ignorance and dangers. No matter what the final truth is in regarding the existence of the seas or the reptilians or any other entities, I think all of us could use this as a personal motto. We live in a very dangerous world, far more dangerous, far worse than most people realize. Yet there is a way to safety and it lies in understanding the nature of the reality in which we exist. This is hard work, but it, but it is easily worth the effort. I'm also grateful to Laura for her courage in facing some of the most difficult issues human beings can face. She is a shining light in a world of darkness. So that was like the end of it. So I actually, just for your info, and Hunter knows this, I share this section of his foreword, and then of course the end that I just read, to, to some of these people in the research community. And it was that when, you know, after I was like, I was committed in my mind, like they're going to read her works. They got to read the way from this because it was so life-changing for both Hunter and I. And, and, and just so you know, in, in, in respect of your work, we have gotten a couple of hundred people to read it and they're all now converts, but, and I know it's not about converting people, but, but, but the truth is, is the truth. And that, segs to this comment i want to read from one of your it's from the seas but it's also your be beautiful summary summary of their work you say all of life is lessons the universe is a field of learning where every event and existence serves as a lesson for consciousness expansion and 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 i take this this is my personal mantra but adopting a learning my, mindset towards life's events can lead to personal growth and a deeper understanding of the universe that is 100 true because once a person looks at everything that happens to them as an opportunity for growth, there is no labeling positive or negative, right? It's just, oh, okay, I want less of this, more of that. And, and, and every experience can give us an opportunity to learn and evolve from. But so many people, as you know, and you write about this, of course, in your works, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, but they, they label a negative occurrence or, or divorce or a loss of a loved one or something. And then they attach to the energy of it and it never escapes them. It's always a part of their life. They take it with them everywhere they go. Well, I can say that even about all of the attackers. Yeah. I learned so much from them and it drove me to studying psychopathology. And I was able to write a whole lot of articles on that topic, which are on the web. And then that's what caused uh, Lobachevsky to write to me and give me his book, uh, Political Chronology. Yeah. We edited and published. And that book is still so amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's crucial reading to understand what's going on on the political scene. Crucial. I yeah. mean, I would say, you know, reading the wave and reading the secret history are, are really important to understand the reality, you know, the history and everything. But if you want to know just about, you know, aliens, and if you want to know just about, you know, political scams and, and, you know, the evil people at the top of the pyramid, then just read high strangeness and political polarology. Yeah. So, uh, there, there's one thing I know we're getting close to two hours today. We've got about 10, 15 more minutes. Um, I, I, we have so much more to cover and obviously we have six more, or I'm sorry, four more, two more weekends, four more episodes after today. Um, the truth about reality creation, I want to save because that's a deep topic, but I, 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 I took this out and Hunter summarized this. So give Hunter credit on this, but, um, the great task of humans residing in third density, and this is, again, your exact words, but to be able to discern between choosing a path that gives immediate physical comfort leading to great psychic stress and soul pain versus a path that may be physically uncomfortable temporarily, but ultimately produces peace of the heart. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, that's kind of the... Turn comes up in the Bible, straight is the gate and narrow the way, and few there be that enter therein, because we are programmed. We are genetically programmed to seek, uh, you know, comfort, the good, what we like, what we want. Uh, right. 
you know, to re reject anything that's unpleasant, you know, and it, and it takes, you know, mental control over yourself to do something that is really painful now in order to have a better future in the future. And a typical example, you know, when I, when I got my divorce, it was the hardest thing I ever did. You know, I really was the hardest thing I ever did. And it, uh, it took an enormous amount of willpower and, and control and so forth. You know, a lot of which, you know, faded at, at different times. Come on. I had five children. Yeah. You know, and, and I was born in this Christian raised in this Christian background and in marriage vows, you know, they're, they're real. They're, they're, they're forever. So I had to change my mind about that, you know, and, and I did that and it was extremely excruciatingly painful. Um, but there are so many other things that people face or confront in their lives where, you know, you have to deal with, uh, you know, cutting off relationships sometimes, yeah. because you know, from the, from the evidence, and this is where seeing the unseen comes in. You see from the evidence, but you don't see on the, on the surface that, uh, you know, this relationship is really negative and bad and you have to cut it off. And then the person comes and, oh, why did you, why did you cut me off? Why did you, you know, and I, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean this, didn't mean the other thing, you know, and you're being so cruel and, and, and you just know that they don't understand and they can't understand. And you just have to find some way to say no. Um, but then there are other things, like I say, going through this attack process, it was, it was really, Oh, extraordinarily educational. And incidentally, I just want to throw this in here. Two of the main attackers that seemed to be, you know, living in it as a full-time job died, you know, rather unpleasantly. Um, so I always wondered about that because they, they, they just kind of imploded on themselves, I guess. But, um, yeah, so there was that, and then there are so many other instances that I can think of, uh, and I'm sure you can think of, where doing the difficult thing is, you know, the thing to do. And working on yourself. Now, that's another thing that's difficult, because people don't realize that the, the main thing you need to do is you need to fuse yourself into a singular being, because... All of us have programs, and I wrote about programs in the wave. You know how you have these psychological programs. You're you're attuned to this, you're attuned to that. You like this, you don't like that. You know all of those things are you know, going all these different directions. You're one person with this person, and you're somebody else with the other person. And trying to fuse yourself into a, a singular being is not so easy, and it's also not so easy to see yourself. You know, and uh, Carlos Castaneda, you know, I think he, I think he, his whole thing was a kind of a riff on Gurdjieff, mm -hmm. but, you know, he took Gurdjieff's ideas and he cast them in a different culture. And maybe there really was a Don Juan, maybe there wasn't, there's was some argument about it. And he knew somebody who personally knew him, worked with him. And he was fairly convinced that there was a lot of, uh, you know, fiction going on there and he talks about moving the assemblage point and Muraviev talks about fusing fusing the emotional center you know bringing everything and developing the eyes of the soul and these are very precise terms for very precise activities and you know we kind of practice them and we teach them to other people and sometimes the most unpleasant thing to do is to sit down with somebody you care about or several somebodies you care about and ask them to sincerely tell you how they see you and how you affect them and how they think you affect other people. You know, in other words, to see yourself as others see you and to really get a glimpse of yourself and then to begin to work on those things so that you can stop uh you know, being that way or doing that or, you know, get a, a feeling for it. And then there is also something that's very difficult. We call it the doctrine of the present, which is when you're in a situation that 
uh, causes you to have an emotional reaction. And you have to you have to learn this and then you have to practice it in your life. Like, you know, your boss says or does something or one of your coworkers or whatever, and you feel you feel the heat rising. And you know, you and you know when it gets up to here that you're gonna you're gonna say or do something that you're gonna wish you didn't say or do. Mm-hmm. You know? And the trick is to be able to stop it here. Mm-hmm. And to sit in it and cook with it and to be able to bring your brain into focus because you know the minute that heat gets up here, your brain is going to be thinking in a different way. Yeah. Here's a good example. And I'm pretty sure I use this in the way women understand this maybe better than men because they have periods. Right. And when they have periods, their hormones go. Pfft. Okay. And when that happens, their thinking changes because something you could say to them one day and they would say, huh. and you say it to them the day, the day their period starts. And then they just, oh, how could it be so <laughs> You don't Never had that happen to me. You don't care anything about me. And, and you You're know. You're so shallow. Yeah. My husband is laughing over there in the corner. <laughs> of course he is. <laughs> yeah. He kept he he kept my periods tracked on a on a Excel database. Smart guy. So that he would know when when he needed to back off and, and say yes, dear, whatever you say, dear. <laughs> but the example that I'm trying to get to here is that hormones can change how you think. Yes. You think today that what your husband said is nothing of any interest or import in terms of negative connotations. But then tomorrow your period starts and you think, and then you, and what happens is your brain starts going and you start thinking of all the bad things he ever did, all the bad things he ever said, all the times he ever, you know, failed you, assuming there are any, my husband never failed me. But, <laughs> yes. So, and, and your thinking changes. Okay, so that's what happens when you have an emotional shock. And it happens to everybody. I'm just using the example of women having periods because it's so evident in that case. And it's so easy to use as an example. But this kind of thing happens to everybody. Somebody says something and it all of a sudden, everything you ever thought about them is changed. You know, your rose-colored glasses, you know, get taken off and you start seeing them with grim darkness. Mm. They never cared about me. They never, you know, and then you start treating them in a nasty way. You know, these are more or less casual examples. There, are, There's more to it. There are other kinds of shocks. But when you get a shock, the object is, is to learn how to keep your emotions here And to keep your brain clear so that you can actually see yourself reacting, see what your body is doing, know that these chemicals are being dumped in your brain and to still maintain your cool and your directedness and your understanding of what's going on in the moment. Mm -hmm. And we spend a lot of time working on that. And here's another thing. Most people don't really have a good, robust feedback mechanism Mm -hmm. about other people's feelings. You, you you know, we all have a theory of mind, what other people are thinking, how they feel about us, what they, you know, feel toward us. Um, And it may or may not be very accurate. Um, So what you do is, is you go along thinking these things and building these theories and making these plans based on the theory of mind you have. Um, there's a couple of good books called Inside the Criminal Mind and, and something else by a famous psychologist that, that shows it in, in a criminal context, which is kind of like an exaggerated caricature, but it's what everybody does. You, you base all your thinking on your theory of mind, what other people are thinking and saying, okay, what if... In the moment, you had people around you 
whom you could ask directly and you know they're going to give you a sincere and honest answer what they think about what you're thinking, what they're thinking. And you have to be able to confess all your petty little thoughts. You know, I was feeling like you really didn't like me anymore. And, and you said this and so, and, and it, and it hurt my feelings and so on. And nobody wants to say that because it sounds so childish and petty. Yeah. But that is what goes on between people. And then those things can build and and end up in divorces, right? Totally. Being able to have a feedback mechanism that, tells you what is really going on and allow that person to explain what they really meant and what they, what they were saying. And, you know, that helps you to attune this emotional center so that you know, when you're feeling emotions, whether they are real or not, whether they have valid basis in factual information. The remarkable thing about doing this is you start to become telepathic, Mm -hmm. literally telepathic when you have feedback because then your reading instrument is being trained to be able to literally communicate with this other person's mind okay so you know that's part of it um controlling yourself uh, all these are very very difficult things to do i I mean when i'm describing it to you i'm sure it sounds kind of simple but it's not it's not <clears throat> only one question to that because i just feel like i just got taken to school because that was incredible <laughs> like that whole narrative you just put together when we do that so when we take those emotions and we block them from coming in our brain and then manifesting and they're like you know communicating with people in a negative way and doing things that we were going to regret when we make that choice does each one of those choices that we individually make reverberate at a hyperdimensional level Because while that is happening, while you're in the state of shock, you are inducting energy Mm -hmm. in your body. If you blow it all out, you know, and you get into whatever and you say something mean or nasty, you know, you've wasted a tremendous opportunity to induct Mm -hmm. energy and to uh, crystallize your emotional center. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah, it goes into other realms and you begin to become, te- you, you begin, to, and I mean, people in this house, we're so freaking telepathic. I mean, it's like, it's not even funny because we've been practicing this for like 20 years, you know, just on a daily basis living. And that's why when people live in, in communities and they have to be small, they can be big. Mm-hmm. Small communities where, you know, it's like a, a, a large family and they need to love each other and they need to get along together and so forth. But then they can begin practicing these kinds mm-hmm. of things. And of course, you know, when you have an extended family, then you it, it's a lot easier to live because, you know, you're not solely responsible for everything yourself. But uh, yeah, so that's that's kind of what we what we work on. And it, it's more it's more than that. You know, it's like taking advantage of negative feelings and using them as in the moment opportunities for growth and how to utilize them. A lot of this work is described in more obvious. And a lot of, you know, Gurdjieff had was using his own little methods that we don't, we love Gurdjieff, but we don't necessarily think much of his cosmology or some of his methods because maybe they worked when he was using them directly with his people. But after he was gone and people started trying to, you know, imitate what he'd been doing and it became kind of just rote. And I, I, we had a a long interview with, you know, Patrick, William Patrick Patterson, who's one of the main purveyors of the, of the Gurdjieffian work at this particular point in time. And he just knew nothing about hyperdimensional realities. His, his responses, I don't know, maybe I can find it and I'll send you the link to it, but it was, it was a very, very disappointing. And at, at a certain point I just turned off. Yeah, yeah. I quit trying to interact with him and just, you know, let it go into rote, you know, because I, when I realized there is no grounds, there, there is no place where anything overlaps. You know, he's, he's on an ego trip and there's nothing I can do about it. I can't change it. 
It's, it's interesting because Hunter and I are the same way. Like when we talk to people now, you know, for whatever academic reasons, you know, inside or outside of the things that we, you know, discuss and work in every day, it's like, if you don't have a multi, you know, if you want to say multi-density or multi-dimensional, it's really multi-density perspective of reality. It's really kind of hard to have a bigger picture conversation with people because they're so linear. They're so in third density. You know, it's honestly like I, I really, I mean, Hunter and I joke about this all the time, but it's like, it's really difficult for us to have meaningful conversations with our family members because they just, they're not there, you know, and you can't condemn them or judge them or, you know, be negative or antagonistic towards them. But you also just have to like expect that you're just not going to have a top of the food chain conversation with yeah. them about reality. It's, 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 uh, it's difficult, you know, maneuvering third density when you are a quote unquote service to others candidate. That's another thing that's good about living in a group. I mean, it's a lot family and, and it became, some of it became more family. I mean, you know, we have, uh, we have 11 people in this house. It's awesome. And three of them are my children. One is my husband. One is my sister-in-law. One is my son-in-law. And then I have uh, four, you know, um, unofficially adopted. Adopted children. Your bonus, your bonus babies. My bonus children. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, we, and we just, we just really, really like, we like living together. We like working together. Um, we have really refined everything. And it, and it wasn't easy because there have been other people who have come and gone who wanted to be a part of it. And some of them were very destructive and some of them just couldn't do it. They couldn't handle it. Destructive, but, destructive to you, to your group or destructive themselves and just couldn't, couldn't sustain living Amidst they, were, you. they were destructive to the environment. I mean, they, they, they created such negativity in the house that it was like when they were finally done, it was like, God, thank God we can breathe again. You know, because yeah. you spend all your time walking on eggshells mm -hmm. because you're trying to help them, but they've got so many problems and so many issues that you just can't do it. I mean, so, I'm like you, Laura. I just shut down. Yeah, I just turn off when I have to. But I had that problem when I was a kid in school. I was in fourth grade in boarding school. And they, they tested me and they put me in a 10th grade reading class, you know, reading and literature, because I was reading, you know, 10th, 11th grade literature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that just tells you how bored I was with my peers in fourth grade when we tried to talk about anything that was, you know, reading or interesting like that, because I was, you know, up there. And uh, it, it created a distance and it was not very pleasant in certain ways, but I, there was nothing I could do about it. But yeah. yeah. Thank, thank God for the internet. And, you know, like what the C said, I mean, the internet is for, I think they said fourth density, a, a form of fourth density networking, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the, the beauty of the internet gives us this amazing conversation for us to be able to share thought waves. The only thing that truly exists which we have again here today. And it's honestly been amazing. So what I left off, we'll, we'll finish or finish. I know we, we're skipping next weekend, moving to the weekend after, but I have the truth about reality creation still. We definitely want to talk about the realm border crossing. There's some questions I think Hunter and I have with like third density service to self going to fourth density versus fourth, third density service to others candidates going to fourth density service to others. Uh, the lesson of love, you have some profound words around that. Um, the primary reason for higher density communication to lower density commu communication and then cloning. I wanted to talk about cloning and then also the, the discussing the fall of Eden, which kind of comes around the whole realm border crossing and how in the past, what that really was about. But, uh, and then of course there'll be a million other things that I'm sure they'll come up. It's impossible to cover your entire, uh, I don't even know how, how do I call it. Just the, the classification of your thoughts. Right. <laughs> There it is, body the of body work. Body of right. work. Yeah. yeah, it's amazing. All right, uh, Hunter, you got anything left? You, you have anything else? I think that's it. Um, this was an amazing day, Laura. So thank you so much for spending the time with us. Uh, you know, we're going to do our best job to get this out to as many people as possible. So thank you so much.